Of course, jazz would never have evolved without the creative genius of musicians and their desire to stand out and leave a mark. But their efforts certainly would have been slowed and in some cases suffocated without timely developments in business, technology, the economy, demographics, and race relations. In the years between the two world wars, several major jazz styles emerged in response to such forces. New Orleans-style jazz was joined by Chicago's hot jazz and New York's sophisticated orchestral jazz of the 1920s, followed by Kansas City's swing of the late 1920s and 1930s. In each case, musicians initiated a new style in response to the demands of employers and popular tastes during Prohibition and the Depression. But the history of jazz in the 27 years following the first jazz recording would be incomplete without factoring in the proliferation and development of radio, records, the phonograph, the jukebox, and sound films, or talkies, technological revolutions that made music more accessible, more convenient, and a lot more pleasing to the ear. After World War II, from 1945 to 1972, these influential non-jazz events became more abundant and potent. During this post-war period, when jazz was thoroughly transformed from dance music performed by entertainers to a socio-political movement led by performance artists, ten major jazz styles surfaced, with a new one emerging roughly every five years. These major post-war styles were bebop, jazz classical, cool, West Coast jazz, hard bop, jazz gospel, spiritual jazz, jazz pop, avant-garde jazz, and jazz rock fusion. In each case, a significant event external to jazz itself greatly enabled the music's development and popularity. From the bebop of Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie in the mid-1940s to the jazz rock fusion of Tony Williams, Miles Davis, John McLaughlin, Chick Corea, and Herbie Hancock in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Before World War II, the chief benefactor of jazz's widening appeal was the recording industry, which was dominated by Victor, Columbia, and Decca. By the late 1930s, each of these record companies had an extensive roster of white and black swing, jazz, and pop artists under contract. In the 1930s, the big three record companies were all offspring of large entertainment conglomerates, which held enormous sway over music's direction and development. The Victor and Columbia record labels were owned by the Radio Corporation of America, RCA, and the Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, respectively. Starting in the 1920s, these companies managed burgeoning national radio networks that influenced the tastes of the millions of American households that tuned in nightly. Although DECA in the United States did not own a radio network, the company had considerable financial backing from Britain's DECA label until 1939, and it specialized in pop and jazz. All three companies' records were pressed and shipped to small local stores around the country for sale to customers, and elaborate and tightly controlled national marketing efforts were used to whet the public's appetite for recordings. During the 1930s, when the Musicians' Union was powerful enough to limit the playing of records on the air to preserve the jobs of live radio musicians, record companies used a one-two punch to stimulate sales.